What if Jesus had never been born? What would our world be like if that manger in Bethlehem had remained empty 2,000 years ago? If you were to get your information only from the popular media, you just might conclude that Christ's existence only brought about the Crusades, the Inquisition, and the like. But please don't tell me that you know what's good for me. There's an arrogance to that. And if you suggest that you're going to heaven and I'm not, you're going to feel better than me. You're up here and I'm down here. And this is the beginning of the Crusades, of all the terrible things that have the more, more uh, havoc in the name of the Prince of Peace than anybody else on earth. Organized religion destroys who we are by inhibiting our actions, by inhibiting our decisions, out of, out of fear of some, some intangible parent figure who, who shakes a finger at us from thousands of years ago and says, and says do, it, do it and I'll f spank you. The way you put it. I've never really thought about it like that before. What have I been doing with my life? I don't believe in rules that tell me how I should live. Even if they're handed down by God? How many crusades were fought in the name of God? How many people died because of someone's religion? This is but a tiny sampling of the overall negative picture painted by the media. But what does history tell us? How has the life of Jesus Christ affected our world? Join us today for a journey of discovery. In this program, we'll hear from people of different perspectives, including Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish, considering the question, what if Jesus had never been born? Beyond any debate, Jesus of Nazareth transformed Western civilization. If Jesus had never come, the world would be a dark and dreary place. Jesus of Nazareth is the most influential person in history. Supposing there had been no Jesus, there would have been no Crusades, there would have been no um, wars of religion. Jesus is the force that has created the modern world. Can anyone doubt that Jesus has made an enormous impact on humanity for the good? Coral Ridge Media presents what if Jesus had never been born? A penetrating look at the impact of the life of Christ on planet Earth, based on the best-selling book by Dr. D. James Kennedy and Jerry Newcomb. 19th century atheistic philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche once said, I call Christianity the one great curse, the one enormous and innermost perversion, the one great instinct of revenge. I call it the one immortal blemish of mankind. The German philosopher Nietzsche coined the phrase, God is dead. Someone saw a graffiti that declared, God is dead, signed Nietzsche. And below it, he wrote, Nietzsche is dead, signed God. But are Nietzsche and his disciple Hitler right when they say, Christianity has been one great curse to mankind? Let's take a closer look. 2,000 years ago, in a far corner of the Roman Empire, in subjugated Israel, an itinerant rabbi had an active ministry for three and a half years, from Galilee to Judea. Jesus of Nazareth went around doing good, healing the sick, raising the dead, and proclaiming good news. He said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And the world has never been the same ever since. So much of the greatness of the West in ideas, in reforms, in science, in music, in the arts, all come back from the influence of Jesus Christ. Dr. Oz Guinness, the author of more than 20 books on faith issues and senior fellow at the Trinity Forum, highlights what he sees as Christ's greatest impact. The one that I would fasten on above all others is the creation of a giving, caring culture. Jesus is the living Son of God who gave us life by dying for us. Father Francis Martin chairs the Catholic Jewish Theological Studies at the John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C. Jesus Christ has been the most powerful influence in the history of the world. The surest proof of uh, the reality and the majesty of Christ today 
other people who are closest to him. Beautiful human lives, huh? a Mother Teresa, an Oscar Romeo, a uh, Francis of Assisi. Thus, the impact of Christianity begins with those lives changed by the transforming power of the gospel. Drug addicts are throwing down drugs in the name of Jesus. Alcoholics are cracking bottles and never drinking no more in the name of Jesus. Husbands and wives are coming back together and children are coming home in the name of Jesus. For more than 40 years, Dr. E. V. Hill has been the pastor of an inner city church in Watts in the Los Angeles area. In my congregation, if I have 70 choir members here Sunday, 30 of them have had experience of being delivered from alcohol, from dope, from every kind of sin you can name. Consider another example of Christ's influence. Go to a library and scan all the thousands of volumes. Every one of them, unless they're undated, has at least an indirect reference to Jesus. Because Jesus coming to earth divided time into BC, before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. One of the important contributions of Christianity is that it spread the ideas of the Jews, a potentially obscure group, into all the world. Os Guinness highlights many of the contributions of Judaism to the world via Christianity. The notion of history being in the line rather than the cycle, or a simple notion like the weekend, which comes from the notion of the Sabbath, or the notion of Covenant, which has given rise to the American idea of constitution. There are many, many of these things which are primarily the gifts of the Jews that were mediated, in other words, taken over and distributed to the world by the explosive growth of the church. It is almost impossible to imagine the depravity of a world that had never been exposed to Christianity. Daniel Lappin is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi who happens to appreciate the contributions of Jesus. The easiest way to, to answer the question of, of whether life on planet Earth is better because Jesus walked Jerusalem or not is very simple, and that is just watch the way people vote with their feet. Watch where the net flow of immigration is in the world today. Is it from Christian countries to non-Christian countries or the other way around? It's so obvious. But perhaps Christ's greatest contribution to human life is his victory over death by his resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. If Jesus had never been born, death would never have been conquered, and none of us, none of us would have a future. I want to give you two ways to interact with us. Remember, Janet Parshall is a radio talk show host. Her program is heard on stations throughout the country. I can't quite frankly imagine a world where there hasn't been a Christian influence because one has to ask themselves the question, if we extrapolate out of the human experience Christianity, what's left? Well, I think that the answer to that question has to be the basic sin nature of man. Critics of Christianity ask, what about the Crusades or the Inquisition? There is no excuse for any of them. They are awful, but they're a violation of the teaching of Jesus. They are not a demonstration of the teaching of Jesus. Dr. Paul Meyer, prolific author and professor of ancient history at Western Michigan University. When you add the credit side of the ledger against the negative exceptions, you find a vast preponderance to show that if Christ had not been born, uh, we would have a much greater negative side of the ledger than we have today. Right today, uh, the lady asked me, she said, well, you fellas are preaching, but it ain't working. And I said to her, I said, you know, you can literally go down the street and smell body odor. Uh, the soap companies are failing to get their message over. And she said, no, no, nothing wrong with the soap. You got to use it. Well, there it is. Nothing wrong with Jesus Christ. You've got to accept him. Jesus Christ, the greatest man who ever lived, has changed virtually every aspect of human life. Charity, the arts, literature, music, government, education, health care, and many, many more. Today, 
we're going to look at just a handful of the innovations that Christianity has brought forth. And the first one we want to focus on may surprise you. 20th century American acerbic agnostic H.L. Mencken once quipped, the truth is that Christian theology, like every other theology, is not only opposed to the scientific spirit, it is also opposed to all other attempts at rational thinking. Was H.L. Mencken right? Has Christianity been anti-scientific? Absolutely not. The fact of the matter is, as you are about to see, Christianity gave birth to modern science. In fact, modern science is a gift from Jesus Christ. It would be impossible to overestimate the full impact of science on modern life. However, what most people don't realize is that science is essentially a Christian invention with initial input from the ancient Greeks. I think actually there were several links between Christianity and the, the rise of modern science. Dr. John Brooke is a professor of science and religion at Oxford University. It's certainly true, by and large, um, in the English-speaking world, the founders of modern science would have expressed uh, fairly strong religious views. They felt this is a world made by a creator who has impressed the creator's will on the world from outside. Critics frequently point to the Roman Catholic Church's mistreatment of the astronomer Galileo in the 17th century as evidence that Christianity is anti-science. Galileo verified the sun was the center of the solar system, a view which was at odds with that of the church. Not only is this something that the church has apologized for, critics often overlook the fact that Galileo himself was a devout Christian and agreed that the Bible set the standard for truth. In a letter, Galileo wrote, Although scripture can indeed not err, Nevertheless, some of its interpreters and expositors may sometimes err in various ways. In other words, what Galileo proved false was not what the Bible says about the universe, but a misinterpretation of what it says, a misinterpretation based on a geocentric or earth-centered understanding of the universe. In reality, Galileo was yet another scientific genius who believed in the Bible. When we calculate the... Almost all early scientists were Christians. The idea that people were, by their science, finding out the glories of God's creation is one of long, long standing. Sir Alan Cook is a fellow with the Royal Society of London, the world's oldest and leading organization dedicated to the study of science. Francis Bacon is often thought of as the father of modern science. He said that there were two books which we should read. One was the scriptures and the other was the book of nature. Since the rise of Darwinism in the mid-19th century, it has often been perceived that faith and science are at odds with one another. But even today, there are thousands of reputable scientists who are believers in Jesus Christ. And in the early days of modern science, virtually no one saw a conflict between faith and science. In the early days of science, it's certainly true that there was no sense in which science and religion were antagonistic. When science as we know it was essentially born in the 16th and 17th centuries, it was from people who believed in Christ who had a biblical worldview. Jerry Newcomb is the co-author with Dr. D. James Kennedy of the books What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? and What If the Bible Had Never Been Written? Just about every major branch of science that has been created was originated by people who believed in the Bible. They believed that they were, in the words of Johannes Kepler, thinking God's thoughts after him. Indeed, some of the most prominent scientists who ever lived were strong believers in God and his son, Jesus Christ. Here is a list of such men, along with the branch of science they created. Louis Pasteur, bacteriology. Johannes Kepler, celestial mechanics. Lord Kelvin, energetics, Blaise Pascal, hydrostatics, Charles Babbage, computer science, Lord Joseph Lister, antiseptic surgery, Robert Boyle, chemistry, James Simpson, anesthesiology, Matthew Fontaine Morey, oceanography, Samuel Morse, telegraphy, and Sir Isaac Newton, perhaps the greatest scientist who has ever lived. 
He is remembered prominently to this day in a memorial at Westminster Abbey. Sir Isaac Newton said, This most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all, and on account of his dominion, he is one to be called Lord God. Sir Isaac Newton wrote far more on faith, theology, and religion than he wrote on gravitation, and there's a reason for that. Once we're given a clue, wait a second, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, then that tells me that one way that I can get to know God better is by studying heaven and earth. And that's why, until relatively recently, all the great scientists were also great Christians. Newton certainly felt one could argue from the natural world to the existence of a creator. If you look at the last a thousand years, 98% of all the major technological, scientific, medical advances took place, again, let's face it, under Christendom. They were in Christian countries. Modern science could and did grow in only one milieu, Christianity. While the ancient Greeks began to investigate the natural world in about 600 BC, they didn't fully develop science because to them it was essentially an academic exercise, mental gymnastics. Science could not have begun in any widespread belief system other than Christianity. Hinduism and Buddhism, for example, teach that the physical world is an illusion. It's not even real. And Islam teaches a type of fatalism and determinism that makes any attempt to change the natural world essentially meaningless. And so science, with all of its manifold benefits, is another gift from Christ to our world. In a front page story, the Washington Post once declared that the evangelical followers of such teachers as Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson are, quote, largely poor, uneducated, and easy to command, unquote. Amazingly, one of the most respected newspapers in the country asserted as fact that evangelical Christians are uneducated, easy to lead fools. Of course, they later recanted. Is Christianity opposed to education? The Romans said, all right, you've got to collect a half a million dollars. There is a strong link between the Christian faith and education, education at all levels. Jesus commissioned his followers to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so Christianity has put great stress on education virtually from the beginning in order to spread the message of Jesus. Education for the elite has virtually always existed, but teaching the masses to read and write is another thing. Christianity, especially after the Reformation, stressed reading the Bible for oneself, which meant that people had to be able to read in the first place. Author Vishal Mangalwadi of India. The Protestant Reformation snatched uh, education from the elite and made it available to the masses. In fact, I, as a former public school teacher, take great joy in going back and studying some of America's early textbooks because what they were were biblical primers. The alphabet comes right out of having scriptural and spiritual messages. Furthermore, Christianity has impacted education at higher levels as well. In fact, around the year 1200, the church created a new phenomenon in the history of the world, the university. The university itself was born in the bosom of the church. The church had a lot to do with the birth of the university system. Alexander Murray recently retired as a professor of history at Oxford University. The church positively encouraged the creation of schools and the financing of them. The University of Paris became the prototype for the university system as various tutors and lecturers would meet with students. Even the name university was coined because of the ad hoc school that was forming in Paris. Paris was like a market where different people were setting up and bit by bit, the city authorities, they said, let's treat them not just as this or that school, but as an altogetherness, universitas in Latin. 
You had students from England studying in Paris who decided to go to a place where the oxen crossed the river, Oxenford, otherwise known as Oxford, and that uh, gave birth to Cambridge. Cambridge gave birth to John Harvard coming over to the United States, Harvard University, 1636. That was the background of our state university system as well as our private university system and so on to the universities we have today. Direct Christian origin. In fact, virtually every one of the first 123 colleges founded in the United States was established by Christians for Christian purposes. This includes many of our most respected schools. Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Dartmouth and Brown were all explicitly rooted in the Christian faith and many of them with very open desires to spread and share the Christian faith and their motto show it. The most common motto in all the American universities is the truth shall set you free. But many people forget that that came from Jesus. The Christian faith has always been in the forefront not just of education but also of literacy and of education for everybody, raising the tide for everybody. What difference does Jesus make? It would be a very cold world we'd be living in today if Jesus had never come 2,000 years ago. We're living in a time in culture where there are a lot of lies out there um, about faith and about the Christian faith in particular. What is the answer to those who denigrate Christianity? Our newly reprinted book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, makes the case for the amazing impact that Jesus Christ has made on every aspect of life, culture, knowledge, history, and freedom. There's nobody who has ever lived who has had as great an impact on culture and the world as Jesus, a positive impact. Contact us today and we will send you What If Jesus Had Never Been Born as our thanks for your generous gift toward the vital work of this ministry. Now back to What If Jesus Had Never Been Born. The 18th century French Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau asserted, I am mistaken in speaking of a Christian republic. The terms are mutually exclusive. Christianity preaches only servitude and dependence. Its spirit is so favorable to tyranny that it always profits such a regime. Rousseau, whose philosophy inspired the incredibly bloody French Revolution, wrote that Christianity could produce only tyranny? <laughs> is this the truth? Well, what about the founding of America only 14 years after Rousseau wrote those words? America the freest nation that ever was created in this world. America was founded by those who sought religious freedom to worship God according to the dictates of one's own conscience. This eventually gave rise to every other liberty we enjoy. The followers of Jesus remembered his words. So if the Son of Man sets you free, you will be free indeed. It's Christianity that has provided the foundation, the principles, the character in the heart of the people that have produced America's goodness and greatness. See, it was Christians who were involved in every aspect of the, the beginning, development, and birth of America. Stephen McDowell is the president of the Providence Foundation, which aims to help Americans rediscover our Christian heritage. So it was Christians who, who colonized our states, they wrote our laws and our constitutions, they started our schools and our universities. Every aspect of the life of America, you can see Christians and Christianity and Christian principles infused into it. The first settlers that founded this land were basically religious dissidents. They were Christians of one sort or another, usually Protestant, and they were seeking refuge in this country. And what they did was they created certain institutions and civil liberties, and they based these on the Bible. There is overwhelming historical evidence that proves that our nation was founded on Christ and His Word. 
The Pilgrims were heavily influenced by the teachings of John Calvin, one of the main leaders of the Protestant Reformation. When the first group of Pilgrims finally arrived in the New World, they wrote the Mayflower Compact, also known as America's Birth Certificate. It affirms their godly motivation for coming here in the first place. We whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do buy these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another, covenant and combine ourselves into a civil body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the end aforesaid. And so, under their biblical-type covenant, the pilgrims experienced religious, political, and economic freedom. Then, in 1636, they used that covenant as the foundation on which they framed a complete, detailed constitution. This led to the framing of almost a hundred other biblically-based covenants, compacts, and constitutions by the year 1776, and it laid the groundwork for a uniquely free and Christian America. Thus the whole idea of constitutional government, as we have experienced it in America, came from an emphasis on political covenants, which can be traced back directly to a Calvinist interpretation of the Bible. And thus was conceived the American experiment of representative government, of liberty under law, and of one nation under God. Dear Lord. Furthermore, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were created by our founding fathers, more than 95% of whom were practicing Trinitarian Christians. These documents reflect a political philosophy taken from the Bible. The Founding Fathers did not intend a secular government. They did not intend a godless constitution. David Barton, expert on America's history and author of Original Intent. The Founding Fathers in their writings say that the Declaration is the foundation for the Constitution. So first off, the Constitution is built on a document that acknowledges God four times. Throughout their documents, throughout the writings, throughout the Declaration, throughout their practices in all three branches, as soon as we implemented the Constitution, they implemented Christian practices. But where did the Founding Fathers obtain ideas and principles to establish a nation unparalleled in its freedom? If you could collect their writings, read their writings, see who they quoted, read the writings of the founding era, see who is being quoted, you'll know where they got their ideas because this is when they're forming the documents. So Henneman and Lutz, two professors from Houston University, collected 15,000 writings from the founding era. They went through to document every single quote. Now, when they broke it down into compartments, you find that 34% of all the political quotes came out of the Bible. So four times more often than they quote any individual, they quote the Bible. Thus, from the settling to the founding of America, the Christian faith played a vital role. If Jesus had never been born, there never would have been the United States of America. My friends, as you've just seen, America was founded on a Christian base, and we have become the envy of the world. Our Constitution has become the model for scores of other constitutions in countries around the globe. But if you say America is a Christian nation today, those are now seen as fighting words to many in our culture. However, if we are historically literate, we know that America was founded by godly men who based our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution upon Christ and His Word. It is precisely because America was founded on Christian principles that people of all faiths have been welcome here. Margaret Sanger, who began Planned Parenthood, once said, I look forward to seeing humanity free someday of the tyranny of Christianity. We so often hear this view of Christianity. Have Christ and Christianity brought tyranny to the world, or have they been the world's greatest force in freeing us 
from tyranny. Before Christ was born, the world was a very dangerous place to live. Unwanted babies were routinely thrown away. Human beings were killed for sport. Jesus was born, of course, into the ancient world, which had a tradition of a rather low appreciation of human life, as witness all the wars that took place, as witness the butchery of the Roman gladiatorial combat, where self-respecting Romans never mind seeing people uh, dirked to death or, or, or gigged to death or hung on crosses or burned or whatever else. This was part of the brutish character of the times. As you know, in the ancient world, hundreds, if not in Rome, thousands of babies, newly born, were exposed every morning on the rubbish dumps, mainly women. But the Christians ultimately ended infanticide, and they ended the gladiatorial contests as well. After all, they tried to follow the footsteps of their master, who was the first to proclaim to the world the golden rule. In everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Furthermore, Jesus Christ increased the value of human life by elevating the value of women. Mistreatment of women was common throughout the ancient world. One of the worst examples of this took place in the nation of India, where women were subject to the horrific practice of widow burning, or sati. It's called sati when a husband died, and very often these would be 10, 11, 12 year old girls married to 40 year, 50 year old men he's dead, then his widow would be asked to die with him, burn on his funeral pyre. The custom of sati had a long history in India. It was practiced widely throughout the country for thousands of years, until the agitation of Christian missionaries finally made it illegal in the 1830s. Thousands of Indian women, even now, owe their very lives to Christ's influence in abolishing sati. Though radical feminists are loath to admit it, it has been Christianity which has affirmed the inherent value and dignity of women worldwide. One of the more interesting things about American culture today is the radical feminist idea that women have been victims of Christianity. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Dr. Janice Shaw Krauss is a senior fellow at the Beverly LaHaye Institute in Washington, D.C. The Bible has been the most effective force in history for lifting women to higher levels of respect, dignity, and freedom. And our Christianity has made us victors, not victims by any means. Furthermore, in many parts of the world, Christianity ended polygamy, a practice inherently unfair to women. Clearly, the Christian faith is the primary instrument for the reform and removal of some of the most egregious violations of humanness in history. For example, by the year 1900, it was Christianity that put an end to cannibalism, a practice found in various parts of the globe. An example of Christ transforming a life and even a culture involves a U.S. serviceman during World War II who was out at a remote Pacific island. And he saw this islander who was carrying a big Bible. And he said to the native, where I come from, we don't believe in that book anymore. And the islander grinned right back at him and he said, well, it's a good thing for you that we do. Otherwise, you would be in here by now. And he patted his stomach. Former cannibals. One of the blights on world history is the practice of slavery. Critics point out that some Christians owned slaves and condoned the peculiar institution. But the countercharge is that slavery was ended by the active interference of Christians. It was the Christian church more than any other agency that was responsible for the emancipation of the slaves. It was William Wilberforce in the 1830s in the British Empire, a dedicated Christian who on the basis of his Christianity worked uh, so desperately to get slaves freed through the British Parliament. William Wilberforce was a long-standing member of Parliament who gathered around him a group of like-minded men who fought the slave trade. First to prevent more slaves from being captured in Africa and brought over to British territory. That took about 25 years. There should not be a slave trade. People should not be misused, mistreated. Secondly, they also fought to free all the slaves in the British Empire. Even unbelieving scholars acknowledge the link between Christianity and the abolition of slavery, such as Robin Lane Fox, an atheist and fellow at Oxford. 
Well, I think for the real impact of Christianity on the history of slavery, you have to look to the 18th and 19th centuries, to England, um, and then, interestingly, later to America, uh, for the impact particularly of evangelical teachings in England. That is enormously important. When Wilberforce was on his deathbed, he received the good news that his lifelong crusade had succeeded and that all the slaves throughout the British Empire were to be freed. And then we also, in our country, on the basis of Christian principles, Abraham Lincoln and others were able to do the same thing. For example, the Underground Railroad was run by Quakers and other devout Christians. In 1835, two-thirds of the members of the Abolition Society were ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you pick up credible history, you'll find that some of the little, small denominations today played great roles in fighting against slavery. If Jesus had not come, the slave, the people who were in slavery, and my four parents would not have heard the good news of freedom, nor would have man known that God was against slavery. The notion that every human being is important comes from Jesus. I'm not saying that Christians have always lived this out unfortunately, but I'm saying these things come from Jesus. He haunts everyone who cares about humanity and world history. I fear for life in America if, heaven forbid, we ever find ourselves in a post-Christian society, because what will come in its place is not a benign neutrality, but a very sinister form of secularism and uh, it's one in which life will have diminished value. What if Jesus had never been born? I don't think I'd want to live in that world. Virtually no value was placed on human life before the arrival of Jesus Christ except among the Jews. And even now, in those areas where Christianity is largely absent, so too is respect for human life. One only need look at the record of godless regimes in the past century to see this. The Soviet Union under Lenin and Stalin, China under Mao, Cuba under Castro, Cambodia under Pol Pot, the list goes on and on. The 20th century atheistic totalitarian regimes have proven to be the greatest killers of all time. More than 135 million people were killed by them. Human life gets its true value when human beings recognize that which was revealed in the beginning, that we were created in the image of God. Bertrand Russell, British atheist and author of Why I Am Not a Christian, said, the Christian religion as organized in its churches, has been and still is the principal enemy of moral progress in the world. Christianity the enemy of moral progress? Is this objection to Christianity well-founded or founded at all? Has the church been a barrier to the betterment of those in need? Jesus of Nazareth had a special place in his heart for the poor and down and out. He told his followers a parable, that of the Good Samaritan. And today we talk about those who do good as Good Samaritans. Jesus told a parable about the sheep and the goats, wherein he said, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. The, the fact that we should care about the little man, poor and sick, and look after him, comes from Jesus. Jesus Christ has made a difference in the hospitals, in the slums. Christ has had tremendous impact. For instance, it was the love of Jesus Christ that motivated the late Mother Teresa to care decade upon decade for the poor and downtrodden of Calcutta, India. Or look at how in all the depressed areas in America, there is a Christian outreach to help feed the homeless, such as the rescue mission in Daytona Beach, Florida. And so whatever we do in the realm of the physical, it's always accompanied with the gospel message. But now you can know you can go to heaven. If you don't know for sure, you can know. Just pay attention today. Or travel across the country to Watts, 
a depressed area of Los Angeles. This is our 14th year of operating in this community what is known as the Lord's Kitchen. We have actually fed a million eight hundred thousand meals, breakfast and dinner each day, except Sunday. What causes that? There is the inner man that has been touched by the power of God through Jesus Christ. Ain't God good? Let's take a moment and look at some great humanitarian movements with strong Christian roots. First. There's the Salvation Army, a Christian denomination with branches in more than 100 nations on earth. <laughs> there wouldn't be a Salvation Army without a savior. Based in London, General John Gowans is the worldwide head of the Salvation Army. And without Christ, uh, there would be no dynamo behind the Salvation Army to push it forward and uh, even to bring it into existence. It, uh, it depends upon a living Christ to exist. The Salvation Army was created by William Booth, who lived in 19th century England, where abject poverty was widespread. General Booth, as he became affectionately known, was a fiery preacher of the gospel, who had a special concern to take care of the poor. Soon, the Salvation Army he founded went worldwide, and it continues its Christian humanitarian work to this day. If you ask in the last year, how many families were helped by the Salvation Army. It is almost 10 million families that were helped in one year by the Salvation Army. Another great humanitarian movement with direct Christian origins is the International Red Cross, which was founded by a Swiss evangelical, Henry Dunant. Since its inception in the mid 19th century, the Red Cross has saved millions of lives. Christ certainly unlocked the forces of charity in the world. The Red Cross grew from the cross from a view of grace and charity and love and compassion, which is absolutely unrivaled anywhere in the world. Do not wrote of his work, which eventually became the Red Cross. My work was an instrument of his will. The symbol of the Red Cross comes from the reverse of the Swiss flag, which is a truncated cross, as in the cross of Jesus Christ. And though the organization may be secularized in many ways today, no one can deny the Christian roots of the International Red Cross. One of the problems we still face, even in modern America, and especially around the world, is substandard housing. We must make it socially, politically, morally, and religiously unacceptable for people who are made in God's image to be living in subhuman conditions. And the followers of Jesus Christ are addressing that issue. For example, Millard Fuller founded Habitat for Humanity International in 1975 as a housing ministry. Since then, the organization has used donations, volunteer workers, and no interest loans to make owning a home a reality for thousands of people who otherwise could not afford a house. Next, we look at Christ and health care. Hospitals were virtually invented by the Christian church. Before this, the best they could do was to drag sick people into the temple of Asclepius in Greece and then get them all together and the contagion would spread, of course. Christianity came along and virtually invented the hospital system uh, whereby the sick would be taken care of and ministered to on the basis of the love of Jesus Christ which should be shared. Another example of Christian impact on health care is that of Florence Nightingale, the founder of modern nursing. Although she was not orthodox in her theology, she most certainly took her inspiration from Jesus Christ. Florence Nightingale brought in a whole new order that started with hygiene, proper organization, and good nursing. Alex Atterwell is the director of the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. It's clear from Florence Nightingale's early diaries, which luckily all survive, that she had a very intense personal religious life. And so we see that in many different realms, including charity and health care, the love of Jesus Christ has inspired so many positive aspects of our civilization. Next, we look at Christ and disaster relief. What happens when a natural catastrophe strikes somewhere in the world? When one travels around the world, every single time there is a calamity. 
I mean, you can't mistake this. Every time there is a natural disaster, who is on the spot? Numerous American religious Christian driven charities bringing relief. That's where it's coming from. Without any question, there are millions of people today as we're sitting here who are receiving something beautiful, either of a physical or spiritual kind, uh, from uh, compassionate Christians. If there were no compassionate Christians, there would be many of those millions who would not receive what they desperately need to face today. I'm totally convinced of that. I hope you understand the true impact that Christ has had on charity. It has been absolutely profound. History shows that even secular charities have received their impulse from the example of Christ, whether they acknowledge it or not. Churches are often the hub of such social programs as food pantries, Thanksgiving projects, collecting and distributing gifts for the needy at Christmas time. And this Christian spirit has permeated our whole way of thinking. Because Jesus was born, there is a great deal of care in this world for the poor and needy. When you see the atheist attack manger scenes, which you would think, uh, this is an innocent, innocuous kind of thing. What do they have against a manger scene, for crying out loud? Uh, it gives you some idea of how powerful Jesus Christ is. If he were not powerful, what would they care? If Christianity were put on trial, the results would be a unanimous verdict by the jury who would say that mankind's life has been dramatically and unalterably changed as a result of Christianity. If Jesus had never been born, we would have had no Francis of Assisi, no William Wilberforce, no Mother Teresa. The world would have been a very cruel and a heartless place. My friends, we've looked at the impact of Christ in so many different spheres of human life. But the question is, has Christ impacted your life? He came for you and me, for the individuals of this world. He came that we might find forgiveness and that we might receive everlasting life. He died to take away the only impediment, which is our sin. And now he offers freely the gift of everlasting life to all of those that will repent of their sins and place their trust in Him. Then you will know that you have eternal life. Do you know that? If not, I invite you to pray with me right now from your heart this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Redeemer of men and nations, I want you to come into my life right now. I believe that you were born into this world of woe for me that upon the cross you endured the penalty for my transgressions, and now you offer me forgiveness and eternal life. I thank you for that. Come, cleanse me, forgive me, and change me, and make me your own. I pray it in your holy name. Amen. Hello, I'm Rob Pacienza, the senior pastor of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, founded by Dr. D. James Kennedy. This Christmas season, I hope that you just prayed with Dr. Kennedy, asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart to change your life. Only Jesus can cleanse you of your sins and give you new meaning and new purpose. If you did pray that in sincerity, we want to help you start on your new path with this book written by Dr. Kennedy called Beginning Again. It is designed to assist you in your new life in Christ. To receive your copy of Beginning Again, just write to our address or call our toll-free number. And may God richly bless you and strengthen your faith this Christmas season. What difference does Jesus make? It would be a very cold world we'd be living in today if Jesus had never come 2,000 years ago. We're living in a time and culture where there are a lot of lies out there um, about faith and about the Christian faith in particular. What is the answer to those who denigrate Christianity? 
Our newly reprinted book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, makes the case for the amazing impact that Jesus Christ has made on every aspect of life, culture, knowledge, history, and freedom. There's nobody who has ever lived who has had as great an impact on culture and the world as Jesus, a positive impact. Contact us today and we will send you What If Jesus Had Never Been Born as our thanks for your generous gift toward the vital work of this ministry. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries. 